<laughs> so so, so uh, let me give you a quick uh, and about Dr. Agarwal. Um, he's got uh, more acronyms after his name uh, uh, that uh, the alphabet, I think. Uh, Dr. Agarwal, MD, PhD, PMNR, FAHPN. Uh, uh, PMNR is physical medicine. Um, uh, as a phys uh, MD, P uh, board certification, uh, physical medicine, as um, as well as uh, uh, FAHPM. Uh, what does that stand for? Uh, fellow of the Academy of Hospice and Palliative, or Palliative Medicine. Wow. Yeah. All right. Back in my next lifetime. I'm be as smart as you, uh, but that's why I'm interviewing you. <laughs> um, reaching out to me, and uh, yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to share what what I can, what what I what uh, what what's of interest. Um, yeah, good. So, so um, I spoke to you earlier, and I, uh, um, we were talking about a bunch of different things uh, to discuss um, uh, before. Any, uh, and I really want to leave this as a not very controlled, ordered situation. Um, so, so I really would like to answer some of the questions that we have uh, with our viewers, um, as well as um, what we plan to talk about. But um, I really want to see if we can focus a little bit of this stuff on um, on PTSD, pain, anxiety disorder, and we could go into psilocybin and and, and uh, any any other psychoactive medications um, that, that you want to talk about. Uh, but I really want to get your expertise in palliative care. Um, and as a and as a physical medicine rehab specialist, um, especially with um, if we can get a little bit more entail into PTSD. To, uh, this month is a Veterans Month, and I just had an interview um, with one of the local TV channels, and we had one of our veterans on. So I think it might fare well for us um, to spend some time on PTSD, pain, and anxiety disorder. Um, uh, but um, again, I want to leave it as open as possible. So, um, uh, can you please uh, uh, tell us um, um, uh, as simply as we can discuss uh, what your belief and diagnosis, uh, a definition of the diagnosis of PTSD is? Yeah, absolutely. So, post traumatic stress disorder, it's. Um, it's a, it's a basically a response, a normal. Well, it becomes disordered when it, but the normal response to serious threats to one's body or um, constitution, integrity, um, some kind of life threat or serious social. I call it like social death threat. That's another type of threat. It doesn't threaten your life, but it threatens your ability to to have a certain role or something those kinds of serious threats to identity core um or you know you're going to be seriously injured or you're in in a battle like you said with veterans or or you're in um a severely dangerous uh, domestic situation or vi violent with lots of us all of those things it's normal for us to be in a um viable trauma response mode um, it's it's a it's a kind of an altered state of consciousness. People have described it as too, um, you know, where you're thinking, uh, your adrenaline is going, and you're a lot more uh, activated and um, uh, vigilant or hyper vigilant. So that that process, once danger uh, goes away and once the safety is restored, um, there are other branches of the nervous system to be in, you know, uh, and the PTSD patients have. Uh, have gone away from that equilibrium oftentimes, or sometimes they're there just for a short period of time. Uh, and uh, the, the alert pathway is, is still hasn't closed the loop, uh, resolved, um, and, and the all okay signal is sort of not uh, reaching or if there's some issue. And, you know, that's, that's I think, what it is. I, I think it's, it's about our 
getting into this uh, alarm uh, aspect of the uh, of the autonomic or sympathetic nervous system, um, and and not um, not being able to go to the. There's other two branches. There's actually uh, there are two branches of the parasympathetic. We always think about fight or flight and rest and digest, but really um, there's also kind of a social nervous system where you're in this comfort and growth and creativity and just like a, like it's it's a it's a it's part of the vagus nerve too um and uh, it actually is a good it's a it's a really good area to to kind of have functional well-being uh it, the, and it's stimulated by uh, you know it has all kinds of interesting facial nervous system or correlates like so you're looking at people's faces and you can feel feel good if you see somebody smile, but if you're in PTSD mode, you see somebody's face that's smiling, you might know that this person has something against you. You know, so it's an important system to be in to reach other people's faces. And that's the sort of the peak nervous system state. PTSD patients are are in that uh, more alarm state, or there's even a more severe threat state where you uh, actually just play dead. You just completely freeze. Um, like um like a yeah. Anyway, that I think is what PTSD is is about. It's it's like in the dynamic sense, and um, not many. Uh, you know, the standard approach to PTSD is let's just put like a band aid on it. I mean, it's, it, you know, band aids are good too when you have serious wounds. Um, but if there's something that's, if there's a, a another deeper level to 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 work in, that's what often gets lost because people might think, oh, you know, you, once you have PTSD, you always have it, and um, you know, it's just we're going. You'll do group therapy, you'll take um, uh, group talk therapy, and you'll take medications and uh, like the uh, psycho SSRIs and, and uh, those kinds of drugs. And, and that's sort of uh, what people do. They just sort of treat those symptoms and, and give people some community, which is important. But um, sometimes that's just not enough. You can still, because, you know, and I think sometimes community people already are a little nervous about large communities, especially when their trauma has occurred in a group setting. So then you come back to a group and you might not trust it as much. So, but I mean, people try to foster a trusting group. And I think that does help too. And none of these treatments are like zero effective. I mean, everything together, these things help, but they don't help all the way. But some other types of alternative treatments, like like cannabis and, and, and psychedelic substances like MDMA, these are, um, you know, also not just in isolation. It's because it's about adding that to this larger therapeutic um, uh, treatment. That uh, you know, PTSD is a very difficult to treat condition. It's just it goes deep. Uh, but I think we sometimes need something to catalyze us out of this, uh, to help us move along, to get the all clear message. And that's what some of these uh, alternative therapies that I've been interested in, um, you know, are are good at doing and, and, and can help the PTSD um, go into post traumatic growth because the ultimate plan future is to have that like it becomes something uh, uh, positive and helpful in somebody's life rather than debilitating so, so dr agrawal um uh, i really really want to get into the treatment portion of it but before we get into the treatment that we just started from the diagnosis and so forth um um i i i have a, I have a question um um which i personally would love to pick your brain on and i'm sure our listeners would I am a, uh, just a quick background, I'm an emergency medicine uh, ER kind of guy, right? Um, so um, we are not much into preventative, you know, even, even though, look, I'm, I'm in cannabis, I believe in it, I got into it because of my um, um, mom. Uh, you know, my mom was diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer uh, in October of 2010. And most of these patients have a, uh, a life expectancy of nine months. Uh, my mom lived till April of 2018, seven and a half years. Uh, most of the years good, some of the years bad. But I got, I gave her cannabis, and she was able to eat, and drink, and you know all that kind of stuff, right? So, um, yeah. so that's how I'm a believer. We have. You know, and we are the state of Nevada, and we have. Uh, uh, I just want to go a little bit to what we do here, um, and then reconnect back to what we we're talking about. Um, 
so, so we, just before you go into that, get your mom. I'm so, thank you for sharing the story. I just want to clarify: she took cannabis, uh, but she also took um, chemo, conventional oncology treatments as well, like chemo or, or other types of therapies uh, with the cannabis, or was it just cannabis? Oh yeah, no, no, no. She she was she was she was, she was getting typical Western medicine as well, right? But but as you know, um, the um, um, you know part of our discussion is pain. The pain and the just the nausea and the vomiting and the dehydration and the lack of lack of lack of um, energy due to lack of oral intake um, that ends up this gets this patients end up in the hospital in emergency rooms and pneumonias and it's a sequela of most of the treatment that kills our patients right um, and, and with cannabis again I. I I give out some some of the some of the people are listeners. I know they know my background a little bit, but I come from a family of doctors. My brother's a spine surgeon. My dad's a doc. And you know, when I first started giving cannabis to my mom, my dad, who's 85 right now, is still practicing medicine. You know, you know old school guy is like, oh, you're making my wife a drug addict. You know, all that kind of stuff. And then after after a few uh, sessions and treatments, uh, uh, they saw that. She's sitting on a dinner table having dinner with us after chemo. So, so, so that, that's how, that's how, I'm oh, sorry. Was it mostly inhaled or oral, sublingual? What was her method of, or oh, Oral, oral, and I'll, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you what kind of oral. Um, you know, at that time, you know, cannabis wasn't what it is now. So I used to get her these jolly ranchers that were, not dosed appropriately, right? So one Jolly Rancher was effective, and one Jolly Rancher, I came home one day, looked through the through the uh, kitchen window, and she's laid out on the floor because I think something. It, was but it, wasn't, it wasn't consistent in the, in the strength. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. One to, one to the other. But if she if she got lucky, hopefully ninety five percent of the time, that was her main main route. I mean, that's a good route. That's called buckle. Buckle absorption because you, you chew that and you know, it's a Jolly Rancher, so it's hard candy and it absorbs on your on your cheeks and it slowly it's a good sublingual. There's a lot of absorption with the tongue um, and, and the cheeks, uh, so that's a kind of a people don't use that as much and it's nice to hear that it helps it, uh, but you do have to you know know how much you're getting there because it can come on. It's uh, but. Seems like she was okay. She kept doing that like all all the time. Yeah, but I mean, years went by, and then I was able to buy those stuff as a as a medical patient. She was she was from California. She lived in California, and the, you know that's that's how I got into this. I'm like, okay, well, this is stupid. Look at this patient. She's her outcomes are fantastic. I can't get dose medicine. This is just you know we need this for our patients, yeah. <laughs> right? So hence we have you know cultivations that we we put our put our genetics that we want and we, you know we have manufacturing facilities and we have dispensaries i'm calling you from a dispensary right now um and we can dispense it to our medical patients i'm not, not medical patients uh but as an er doctor my most of my experience is patients coming in ptsd of some sort of an acute some situation psychosis or over medication or ended up in, in jail because they did something crazy. Um, so my brain doesn't work like yours. I, I don't, I can't assume how your brain works, but, but you know, we're, we're in an emergency setting. I don't have time. Patient comes in, let's stabilize him, either, you know, knock him out, intubate him, whatever. But it's not something as, as methodical um, as you guys do. Um, so, but PTSD prevention does begin in that, uh, you know, to, to stop. If somebody comes in with serious trauma that you know that they're going to just, just completely shock your system, they saw a horrible car accident or or were, you know, in severely violently injured or whatever it was, like, um, that in that window of time, in the first few hours, like, it's actually um, people are, like, the military's on research on, oh, let me give people propranolol. Let me give them at, uh, beta blockers to lower the sympathetic tone so that later on, and that's what they've shown, like, later on, they don't get severe, like, this is not going to haunt them for the rest of their lives. And apparently they're, they're saying that it, uh, there's been some studies that do have tried to do this, and, and apparently it does help in that way. I, I don't remember uh, how how long duration they looked at, but that is that is I think cannabis is also uh, and, and these kinds of medicines, especially cannabis though, because it's so, it's so effective 
at that acute um, uh, it can it can really be effective in that in that window and I think um, low dose is really good like uh, not like not really high dose THC and all that where people can get more anxiety or fear but even like for much smaller doses it can actually I think be something that could be used in emergencies um, and I, I've seen I've also seen people use cannabis in um, there's a, a paper in Europe where somebody had a um, injury uh, mountain climbing or something and they broke their leg or they had some some serious orthopedic injury and uh, and they had to set the bone or something uh, in a you know wilderness medicine and all they had was cannabis and apparently like somebody doctor or somebody was there wrote it up that it really gave the patient an anesthetic enough was calm, calm response if you went to the your your clinic or your er you would do give them fentanyl midazolam like uh benzodiazepine you don't they didn't have that so apparently cannabis inhaled can help with that too so these are like trauma these are physical trauma and, and so i just think that like um we end up seeing all the chronic PTSD because nobody really ever used cannabis or these kind of things early on. But there is a good prevention that can be done in the emergency room um, if we had kind of, um, you know, I, I, it's very hard to get cannabis in an emergency room, you know, or in the ambulance or any of those places, right? It's only in the in your kind of dispensary store that we are able to, you know, people are doing this, but. Uh, there was a research study in Israel where they tried to give t- uh, cannabis, cannabinoid in the, uh, to be people with brain injury, traumatic brain injury. Uh, and the, it was a long time ago, and they, they used a different pharmaceutical cannabinoid. So it, it didn't really work that well. But um, I think it's, uh, it's really interesting to help uh, for, for that application as well. So I'm kind of sidetracking, but you were, you were saying you're an ER doc, so you think more on that side of the fence. I think more about chronic, uh, life-threatening like conditions um but i think um cannabis uh, and these kind of alternative therapies could also help us in the acute side of our uh treatments if we um i also know patients that use we're talking about pain I, i've heard i've met some a number of patients actually who told me they use cannabis instead of anesthetics for dental procedures uh like root canal or some kind of thing they, they use like maybe like the one your mother used like a, uh, a candy or an oral or something like that so that that's also really um you know that's also a pain prevention you know a lot of post dental pain syndromes uh, I, I, we treat those in the clinic a lot they get you know trigeminal neuralgia like pain in the face that's severe because or, or injury to one of the nerves in, in the in the jaw and they have a horrible, they, they get trauma and they get injured. So, and they get pain. So, because the, the experience in the dental chair was so horrible because the pain was under control, under treated and they, you know, they had no control. That's another thing of PTSD. These are the situations that increase the risk of PTSD is when you are having an experience and you feel like you've lost control. You know, you, you can't do anything. And, uh, and so a lot of patients in, in dental chairs have that experience and they get that injury. Uh, but if you could treat the pain better during the time of the procedure, they are less likely to develop chronic pain that's going you know, to be debilitating. And I think that's, um, these are really, it's good to think upstream uh, because, um, I, yeah, I feel like uh, a lot of anesthesiologists, they're thinking, oh, all they think about cannabis is how much cannabis is my patient using and so how much more fentanyl do I need to give them or propofol. Or that's right. That's right. To, to, to cover it. But that, but that must tell you that maybe there's the cannabis takes you some of the way already or something. Well, you yeah, end up using more actually. So it's it's it, you're starting from a different baseline, you know, potentially. And I think it's it's worth uh, exploring that. Actually, there is some ancient Indian texts. I know you studied Indian medicine. Uh, the ancient Indian surgeon Sasruta, Sasruta. Um, uh, I don't know what. BC century, and apparently some of the writings of Sasruta cannabis is, is used in anesthetic procedures for surgeries. So uh, that is uh, something I've heard, and I don't know the original reference, but you can look it up. And I think that um, something we've lost. Yeah, yeah. Actually, it's, it's funny you bring that up. Uh, that our our our, our um, uh, mother company uh, we named it as New Veda uh, because it was from the Vedas, which are the old sutras. Um, of the um, Hindu uh, uh, religion, tribe, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, the third and the fourth Vedas 
the sutras were all just all about cannabis and and um, uh, so that's why we named our company new veda you know it's um uh, new, N-U or N-E-U? N-U, N-U-V-E-D-A. Oh, nice. Right. Look, Ay- Ayurveda, Ayurveda, which is a plant-based medicine, um, is, uh, is a fifth Veda, right? Um, right. right. That's so, uh, Veda. That's um, right. That's the Atharva. Uh, that's the more latest in the, in the collection, and there is lots in there about plants, and um, cannabis one of them. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, we've lost... Uh, we. There's so much, uh, that's why I work, I really love working with doctors who are really skilled in plant medicines of all kinds, because there's a lot of medicines in the plant kingdom that um, allopaths, you know, don't learn about because we just don't, our our professors don't teach us or don't know about, oh, you know, the treatment of, um, like I had a patient the other day, like I work with naturopaths, and she has severe mycobacterium avium complex chronic lung infection and has to take a year of antibiotics or something but in order to to start the treatment she has to and she's had it before she had to get a sputum sample but um you know she said she could not make a sputum sample at at all it was dry 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 but a naturopathic doctor that works in my in my clinic he prescribed uh, a tincture with datura an herb herb of datura which is another you know plant medicine ancient and apparently that allowed her to secrete enough it, it sort of all of a sudden made it possible to make us make a, a sputum sample. So, like uh, plants can do amazing. Like normally, what would a doctor, you know, maybe, maybe these other other drugs we would prescribe? But uh, I just think the power of the plant is like kind of uh, under underappreciated, and that's why I really love working with naturopathic doctors who who have and other herbal do, herbal knowledgeable people because cannabis is really like uh, a great herb. But it's got a lot of good family as well, you know, and I think it works well with other other herbs too. That's another. Um, it's kind of a, it's its own thing for sure. It's got so much variety and uniqueness because it's got such a, um, you know, it's wind, it's two sexes, wind pollinated, a lot of genetic diversity. It's got all this different ability to make a variety of different compounds, you know, in the in the in the resin, and you know, all the other parts of the plant too are also very good if you if you need nutrition you know to survive too which is also an important thing to see anyway i'm just saying that like uh it's great like that but there are other plants that um uh, it, it can also that we that hopefully it cannabis will wake us up to those other plant medicines because we really um uh we've been sold a bill of goods because people just want to sell us the medicines uh, that they make and they're only exclusively in their lab because that's a good business model. Like you only, you need that drug, uh, only I can make it. Not like, oh, let me give you a seed, you know. So it, uh, unfortunately, we just let that happen. We don't have to let that. We could say, oh, no, we believe in, you know, um, like India did for a little bit. Like we, they have government-owned pharmaceutical companies like CIPLA or are they, like, they just like this is how we, we believe we, it's an important field. But it's for the gut, it's for the people, and then we wouldn't have to worry about CIPLA making lots of money. They would say, "How do I get this to more people safely, affordably?" So cannabis like that. So anyway, I just wanted to. I, I, we're so used to saying that thing. Oh, you know, everyone's in it for the money, and we don't. We can't. We could actually do something very easy if we did recognize that our country was more than just maximizing a private business's profit, but actually providing for the well-being, including the health, health and well-being of people. And, Anyway, that's my little. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, no, no, you're you're 100. Look, you're 100 on point, and and um, and um, uh, we have a look. We have a question uh, about uh, uh, psilocybin. Uh, yes. no, 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 we're not going. I've been anxiously waiting to get it to that point, but hold on one second. Uh, hold on, because I want to. I want to. I want to really talk about the main items of the uh, the diagnoses. Um, and then get into the treatment. But let me take a sidetrack on what you talked about, plant-based medicine. And, and as, as you said, you know, I, I moved to India for a while to, to study plant-based medicine as a Western doc, right? And I get there, and, and these guys, uh, by the way, all of these guys that, that, are, that are practicing Ayurveda, uh, at least in Kambator, India, and the, the hospital I was at was called Vaidegrama, and um, in Vitagrama, all of these guys are MDs that go to training for um, 
plant-based medicine or Ayurvedic medicine. Uh, I, I, yeah, A-U-I-R. Yeah, they put MD, parentheses, A-U-I-R. Yeah. Ayurvedic medical. Yeah, they have the MD. Sure. It's and, amazing. And then, you know, you know, I was a professor of medicine to schools and, you know, all these accolades or whatever. And <laughs> I, I show up there and, and I, and I, and I, and I'm, I'm a student essentially trying to learn how this stuff works. And I, I'm sitting there and I feel like I am just an idiot. I have no knowledge and, of what they do. And the level of like, when I talk about hypertension, I'm like, well, you know, how about you know, treating hypertension, beta blockers, you know, ACE inhibitors, you know, type one, type two. And they're like, you're treating the symptoms. That's the stuff to treat the symptoms. What we do is, you know, they like, well, we take the root of this plant and we, in oil and we dry the the leaves of this other plant and we mix it together and this is how you manage your doshas which are the three main doshas of how they they take your pulse and your tongue and your, your poop and all that and and uh and and they and and they come with these solutions that i saw these patients that there's no way we could have treated them with what we know in western medicine and and it's just it's just beyond belief what plants can do, and you're 100 percent correct. You know, we at the Western world are are, are at the mercy of the synthetic medications uh, that are available for everything that we we want to take a pill for, and you know, um, so I'm 100 percent on point there with you, and and I believe that cannabis has has opened the door and the gateway to the next level of us going back to the sutras and going back into who we are as humans and be able to connect our organic body with the organic plant. Yes, uh, yes, that's beautiful, beautifully said. Or, or, the organic, the mixture of our bodies with the plant bodies. I just wanted to show your viewers this because you're talking about uh, uh, blood pressure and Ayurvedic medicine. This is a herb that I've heard a lot about, our combination product that uh, some of the doctors, uh, uh, naturopaths I know work with, cardiotone. And it's just, it has that, um, it has several different things. You know, um, you know, one of the ones that I know is Raulfia, like this one here, root. That's one of the roots, you know, that you can kind of mix up. And maybe that was the root they were talking about. Um, and it has some, um, you know, something called Reserpine in it. And anyway, there's a bunch of other things in here. But anyway, this is a company that's here and locally, um, uh, this Dr. Sodi, I actually worked with him when I was in school. Um, uh, he has the MD Ayurveda, uh, and he also has an MD degree. He's a pretty cool dude. Anyway, he's, he's up in Seattle, Seattle, right? He's in Seattle. He's yeah, out uh, uh, Greater Seattle. He, yeah, yeah. I've seen him. I've seen him give. A, I've seen him give a speech. Uh, 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 he's a cardio cardiothoracic guy, right? There's a couple of brothers. There's a Shalinder and Barinder, and there's another one I can't remember. Um, yeah. Uh, but he, he's I don't remember him having cardiothoracic specialty, but uh, he, he's very knowledgeable and um, taught me. Uh, you know, uh, I was I really appreciate what he taught me. But I just think that people don't know, like they they're never nobody knows that. I mean, gosh, uh, people spread about their blood pressure so much. And anyway, I mean, it's a, it's a that's the kind of beauty of integrative medicine is to to combine different types of medicine together, like. It's good to also know how to do an echocardiogram and know when the renal artery stenosis, the closing of the artery, of the uh, is the reason why your blood pressure is so like, or that is contributing in a big way. So there are things like that, but those are more rare. But it's still good to have the rare because in a large population, the rare becomes more common. <laughs> so when you're you know sitting in the hospital, you see all the rare things because that's like you, you serve a thousand, tens, a hundred thousand, five hundred thousand millions of people. Uh, Sunil, I want to stop you right here and I want to immediately tell, tell you one thing that uh, I, I reserve the right to bring you back on this thing again because it is 38, 39 minutes past and I feel like we have so much to talk about, right? We started, we started late though with all the sound issues, but I, I don't know if you guys can go longer. I'm, I'm happy to, but Go, 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 what, what, maybe we need to move to that question. Are you? Are you yeah, yeah. So, so let's. Uh, I didn't want to. Uh, I really wanted this open talk. And, and again, I'm going to reserve the right to. Uh, you can't say no, and you have to say yes. 
Uh, so uh, I, I think we're going to have a lot to talk about. Um, but but let's get to one. Uh, let's get to the next diagnosis of understanding um, the, as as physician, but also as our as our listeners, um, what anxiety disorder is, and then go back and discuss for the treatment plans for both PTSD pain and anxiety disorder. And once we get in there, I'll have some more questions. So can you tell us as a uh, physical medicine and rehabilitation physician and a palliative doctor that that basically help people uh, at, at different stages of their life. What is your definition of an anxiety disorder and how can you correlate with pain and PTSD? Um, yeah. So please. Oh. Well, yeah, it's a, that's a symptom, anxiety. You know, um, there are anxiety disorders too, but it's often anxiety is sort of part of a cluster of other symptoms, especially when you're dealing with like, uh, you know, you have care patients like who have, let's say, cancer, like your, your mom had, that she may have had pain, she may have had anxiety, and may have had also um, fatigue or, or bloating or fullness. Like there's all, it's all, it comes in these, in these pairs. I mean, there are people who just have pure anxiety as well, but when it comes to medical illness, like, um, uh, you know, that's where you see it. And, and then PTSD is really like a, actually, I think, considered an anxiety disorder. It's, it's in that family of, of conditions. Uh, anxiety is really like excessive worry, ex uh, ex uh, excessive fear, worry. I mean, uh, it's, um, again, it's, it's kind of, it's important, again, to have uh, worry and concern when you need to have worry and concern for your survival. That's a, there's nothing wrong with that. It's when it becomes too much or excessive or debilitating, incapacitating, limits your ability to function um, personally, socially, relationships, uh, occupationally. So that's sort of the, the rehab doctor definition. You know, uh, people, we want to look at how it impacts function, whatever that function means. So um, it's, um, I guess, that, that kind of state. And a lot of, there's, I, mean, I, I think that this whole, uh, this is an age of anxiety is what, something that I've thought about. Like, it's, it's so, uh, there's so many um, large worries and concerns like that affect the entire, um, our entire species. It's not just like your own day-to-day, -day, like, okay, you know, um, worries, which are real too, financial anxieties and, and just uh, housing, food, like basic security. But then there's like much larger things like uh, uh, the climate um, changing and everybody getting worse and worse weather and horrible, horrible things and, and war and, and all, all the kind of uh, huge um, fights over people's rights. And th those kind of things become, uh, I think, it's, I mean, we've always had that. We've always had war and fights and that kind of thing. But the, because we're interconnected much more now, and uh, we, we know what's going on around the world like this, like with more information, there's a lot more. So there's a lot of potential for also a lot more good to know about all the, the non-worrisome things. But unfortunately, the worrisome things become much more uh, pro prevalent. And um, anyway, so age of anxiety. So everybody may have some anxiety to some degree you know, um, based on that. And, and then there's other people who have more, you know, more severe cases. So it's a spectrum. Um, and, you know, I think um, there's wonderful, like, uh, you know, the contemplative traditions have helped people a lot, uh, you know, meditation to change their worry mode, um, just kind of slowing down and breathing the breath. And those kinds of things are uh, basic breathing techniques and 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 refocusing techniques um and i think um i i think that's we sometimes it's very hard to just sit down and do that when you're just really crippled by anxiety or you're just so stuck in that mode that you can't switch but that's where uh medicines can be helpful you know like cannabis um to uh, and you know I, <laughs> Micro just a roll of microdosing cannabis like that. I think people underappreciate that uh, the ability of cannabis to work, and if you do low temperature vaporization of, of really small doses, like you know a fifth of a of a gram, like um, of cannabis, like I, I've I've seen point I think point oh two something like that, or 
micro, like micro, hundreds of micrograms uh, of cannabis, 0.02, I think is the, the number I've seen, um, grams, will give people like a strong effect, even at a low, small amount in terms of anxiety. I, I, I can speak from personal experience. Cannabis at much lower doses, you get more terpenes, you get more um, flavonoids, you get more of the other, uh, other like the entourage widens. And, and uh, there's a lot of good, like linalool is a good pain, uh, anxiety relieving medicine. It's from lavender. Cannabis also makes it. So, you know, they using cannabis for its entire spectrum, not like a eh, high dose and, you know, all things like that. I think that's really an underappreciated area. And um, um, I, I just wanted to tell people about it. I, I, I saw a, a device called a, a DynoVap, Dynatech DynoVap. They, they have some interesting induction heat, and they are able to, to really generate these low temperatures um, if you just keep, don't heat it very much. And so that, these are some of the tricks I think that are, people will start to appreciate. The go low. Sometimes less is more. Um, and then you combine it with other things, and you can really go far. Cause also, because the cannabinoid system is biphasic, like you can give somebody enough cannabinoids and you'll make their anxiety worse. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's certainly the uh, same thing with pain, which is the other diagnosis we were talking about. But uh, so it is. Um, I think we 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 kind of will be surprised by uh, cannabis in that way. So so I, I, we already I think we already migrated to that. As we have about fourteen minutes left, and you asked me if we can go any longer. Um, uh, we 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 have a very clear commitment to our team and to our patients that we start on time, we finish on time. I apologize for my uh, uh, technical difficulties. Um, uh, uh, um, but um, um, so we've talked about PTSD, what it is, somewhat discussed the connection of pain with PTSD and anxiety disorder. And really this talk was about uh, the, um, the treatment of such. So, so I, I, I think if we can just put all of those in one big bucket with PS, PTSD being the majority of this bucket or the umbrella over this, and let's talk about the treatments. In, and I know we talked about cannabis or psilocybin or any other plant or synthetic medications uh, that um, um, uh, we could use outside of the realm of a typical Western medicine, which includes SSRIs, but um, uh, um, the yeah. so, so, le, 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 uh, psychiatric medications, let me just put it in one category, that are currently being recommended by psychiatrists, physicians, and so forth. Let's leave that out. Um, yeah. And um, yeah. let's no, go that, over yeah, uh, not, to, to that portion of it. I'm sorry, what? I said, let's go over to that, to that yeah. side of the discussion, please. Yeah. Certainly, um, I think the uh, first thing I want to say about that is um, cannabis we've talked about, but uh, I think the step back behind all that that I'm really interested in is uh, what you might call spiritual or existential dimensions of, of, of pain, anxiety, PTSD. The, that aspect of our, um, of our healing, our therapy, and our recovery um, uh, is not addressed in the current conventional system in, in any meaningful way, unless you're if you're unless you're dying, if you're palliative care and you're on hospice, uh, and, and not so, even yeah, even sometimes less on palliative care because people don't have spiritual care, but in hospice you do. That's the only time we address. I mean, there's it, it actually a requirement to address spiritual concerns, like from the federal uh, rules. Most of the time, but but you have a spiritual needs throughout your life. It's not just at the end, you know, it's like the beginning, the middle, and, the and that, that's the, that's sort of a, uh, um, I think that's the beauty of this class of substances, cannabis and psilocybin and, and the whole, I call it, well, I don't call it like, there's a term entheogens. This is a class of substances that have uh, uh, various kinds that have been used historically in, um, you know, spiritual or religious rituals to induce um, awe or great states of consciousness. Uh, and, or chemicals that are like them that we use now. So it's, it's, a, it's a thing. It's an area of, that's what I'm really interested in, and in high or low doses in groups or privately. Like, I mean, there's, it all, it, it seems to have a, uh, it will have a, a very unique effect in treatment in these conditions. 
And we already know that from scientific evidence, from historical evidence, um, and, uh, you know, uh, people also from their own observations of, of, of people who have um, used those kinds of substances to heal uh, from PTSD pain or anxiety. And, you know, it's a, that's sort of what I, I think is uh, the big deal, like uh, the ability to, to hit a if, if the pain syndromes and PTSD, like we talked about, and anxiety, which is kind of like an aspect of PTSD, you are flipped in a certain mode. And chronic pain, the, the nervous system has changed. You have pain for less than three months. It's a different story. But if the pain keeps going and going, uh, you have what's called wind-up and central sensitization. The whole nervous system gets sensitized, just like you have when you have PTSD, sensitization. Um, it's a different type of thing, but it's it's like that. So you need to find systems to shut that down, to shut down, to enhance the uh, pathways of uh, relief inside, the all clear message, both from pain and from uh, danger. Anyway, and pain, of course, we often associate with danger. When you're getting hurt, uh, you know, uh, when you feel pain, you might think that something's wrong with me. I'm falling apart. I'm I'm stepping on something. I'm you know whatever. I'm doing something wrong. Uh, I ate something wrong. Like it's always pain always brings up worry and anxiety, chronic pain, especially if you don't know what's going on. So all of that to say, cannabis will help uh, in these to shift into people's more of a like let me get behind the awareness of what's happening. Let me connect to a different sense of of, of um, self. You know, where I'm just not identifying with my pain or, or identifying with my, you know, constant worry, ruminative, or um, what do you call it, hypervigilant thoughts. I'm, like, connected to a more calming potential um, overview self. And that is, I think, a uh, that requires a spiritual or existential skill set or a uh, ability. And that's what these medicines make really, like, give you. In, in a, uh, if you if, if you want to receive that uh, in general, like maybe not 100% of the world, obviously everyone there's variations, but for the vast majority, it seems like these medicines, psilocybin, the other one, is an ingredient in mushrooms, um, 100, 200 species of mushrooms, and naturally occurring, um, and you know it, it it's been used also uh, as an entheogen throughout the ages in multiple settings, um, and um, it has a low dose and high dose effects as well, just like cannabis. Low dose, um, we think there could be some changes to mood over time that it boosts your neurotransmitters because psilocybin is very close to serotonin, which is a mood enhancing molecule, a chemical in the brain. But um, uh, I think there's, there's less knowledge about that, I think, but there is still like, less controlled studies. But I think there's definitely something going on at low dose. But whether you have to use it every day, like you use a, a Prozac, that's kind of the, we have we have to sort of get out of the model that you have to take a drug every day because you come back to zero. You know, like that's what the idea of allopathy. Okay, you, you're on 25 milligrams of sertraline every day because you get up here and then by the end of the day you're back down here and then you go back up here and like you go up and down because the chemist chemistry of the that's how we think about it. But if you think about these like in terms of like what will a low dose allow me to work through or complete psychologically, then you are not starting at the same level the next day. You're a little bit better, you know, and so you kind of, uh, go, that's not like a daily same dose drug thing. Psilocybin. Um, the bigger dosing, of, you know, has been shown to interrupt the default mode network. That's like the whole standard operating system of the brain you know like where you're what you're doing when you're just sitting sitting around and not thinking about anything in particular um and it, it it increases the connectivity between areas of the brain that don't normally talk to each other the higher brain centers and some of the lower more primitive areas of, the, of our brain and that, that kind of thing is like we call shaking shaking the snow book you know, increases the entropy of the brain and nervous system, which the disorder. And that means you have more degrees of freedom. So you don't have to get stuck in your, it's, easy, it's easier to get unstuck from your PTSD or your, your, you know, kind of the pain, worry, anxiety cycles. That's very powerful. Uh, and, and actually leads to more growth of the brain and nervous system, what's called neurogenesis. This has all been published and found 
so Dr. Agarwal, let's talk about let's talk about the dosing of psilocybin um, um, uh, real quick. Um, uh, we have we have about five and a half minutes left. Um, so uh, the um, would would is there a like a loading dose of psilocybin um, and then continuation of a uh, micro dosing, meaning that you you take a larger dose and then you go like, or once a week. You take a larger dose, and and, and is there any uh, association between the level of this connectivity, which you're talking about, with the more anterior cortex, uh, the, the the upper part and the lower part you're talking about? Um, I, I, I dip, so meaning that if I take I don't know what a micro dose is uh, amount wise, but let's say uh, whatever it is, of a gram of dried mushroom, like people in those in those tenths of a gram or. Two tenths. It's a small dose. I mean, there's variations on that, and of course, we're talking about now fungal material, which varies as well. Not all the fruiting bodies, and you can also use not just the fruiting body of the mushroom, but the mycelium. There's some mushrooms with a mycelium, which is the under, the under, uh, the network part of it, not the fruiting body, which is basically a reproductive organ. Um, and also, anyway, the psilocybin will vary depending on. Uh, on where you get it from, like what uh, the mushroom you're using, or which part of the mushroom you use, um, and the dose, uh, the dried weight dose, I should say. But um, you know, in the clinical studies, the uh, 25 milligram, 20, 25 milligrams is what they've been using in the, you know, for the um, spiritual experience in, in treatment of uh, just. I'm, I'm sorry, you said 25, 25 milligrams. Yeah, 20, 20 to 25. I can't remember. Wow. Sometimes somewhere in that ballpark, uh, I think. So that's about that's all. That's all they've been used. Um, and so, you know, but uh, your mushroom uh, people don't normally have access to chemical psilocybin like these researchers do. They use, they, they grow it from the mushroom. Um, so that's, uh, the conversion is different. Anyway, that's, all that stuff is like wi widely available and known um, on the internet and everything, which is a wonder, wonderful thing. We didn't, in the old days, nobody knew anything because there was no source of, you had no source of information um, to, to check, maybe look here and there. That was hard to get or out of print, very expensive. You know, so that's a nice thing about, uh, again, the interconnectivity of our, of our uh, ecosystem of knowledge. As far as like a protocol of macro and micro dosing, um, you know, expo explorations, I think, you know, probably it depends on, again, what the context is that you're doing this in and, and for what purpose, because there might be some um, individuals, you know, who, who um, aren't ready for that big reset, aren't ready for that kind of, because it can last several hours to go through that experience of like uh, turning off the default mode network. And, um, you know, um, and it, it can be, you know, an, uh, an ordeal of experience. And if you just don't have that time, don't have that uh, feel like you can't handle that or you don't have the support or you just want to, I think there's a value to that. But you have to be ready for that. So there, if you can do that and you could just do micro, I think that there's still that could be a way to do it until you're ready for a macro. I think they have different effects, and it really depends on what you're using. And then, you know, I, again, I'm believing of the group model. Like, let's say you use this substance in another uh, a group of people who have this problem or are using it privately or with, with an assistance, mm -hmm. with just one 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 on one. Those are all the different um, considerations. Um, in groups, you 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 can use less um, because there's more of a group connectivity going on. So, anyway, I'm just kind of um, riffing now. But let me give you even a bigger thing about psilocybin. Just what, um, if it's okay, um, Michael Winkleman. He's like a Arizona expert, and he wrote, wrote a paper with a Brazilian um, our anthropologist. Um, they're saying psilocybin mushrooms were the foundation of human evolution to getting to what they call the social cognitive niche, that we got more cooperative and, and had more like ability to kind of trust each other and play in, in camp around the campfire. Uh, and this increased our ability to be more social and cognitive. Uh, so it is like a, it, that's the leading one of the leading hypotheses of uh, how, how we, so, you know, did humans stop? Are we like now at the peak of our brain cognitive development? Have we figured everything out and now we're done? We're just now not time to, you know, become energy beings or whatever. I don't think so. <laughs> like, I mean, I, everything in this earth, that's it goes through its cycles and it goes through changes and improvements. And I think 
we still need that. We still need the help of the uh, of the mother of you know the earth, and that's that's kind of another layer of this. So. So let, 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 it's, we, got, we got 30 seconds. I want to give you one response. There's a book uh, by Terence McKenna, Foods of Gods, that does talk about the size of the human brain. And really, it started uh, 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 exponentially increasing in, 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 uh, in the grams of the brain when we became herders, uh, sheep herders, so, and, and cattle, where, where mushrooms grow under the, you know, the cow pile. And that's where the really humanity started taking off. Um, yeah. One. That's right. Terrence McKenna. Stone Age hypothesis. It's very it's old now, and he didn't have he conjectured it, but now there's actual more evidence and data and things like that. It, I think he's on something. I think where yeah. it's a it's a uh, and the brain size is also about nutrition. Like what are you eating, and like how much can you can your brain grow? Um, and so I think there's, it's, it's a diet thing as well. Uh, but there's something going, like, if you look at this paper, you'll see, like, uh, it's called the sociocognitive. I have more on it. I can send, send yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, I will get that information from you, and we are going to get back. In fact, I'm going to tell our marketing team that, that uh, we are going to continue this meeting. It's exactly 5.01. Uh, there was one question that I want to respond to um, uh, about confidence um uh, confidence and uh mushrooms and if, if, if it's maybe the, the the powerlessness of post-traumatic syndrome um which uh, i really agree with 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 whoever left that comment I for us so. yeah uh, yeah i see that too i agree with you're right i think rollo wexford has been really great on giving us comments so i think i think he's uh, he or she they are um they are saying uh i think yeah, confidence is like a, a kind of a ability to be uh, to trust yourself, really. Like yeah. that's that's kind of I think a part of confidence. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, uh, Doctor Agarwal, it's been an honor, pleasure. Uh, I don't know all, all of the all of the above uh, speaking with you today, and also in the preparation for this meeting. Um, again, I would like to invite you to come back on, and hopefully, may, maybe just the, our next time we have this, we'll we'll continue with this. Uh, for the people who are listening, thank you very much for being on. We appreciate you. We do this for you um, and uh, our, our, our patients. Uh, so um, with all the blessings um, uh, to everyone, thank you for being on and see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Send me the link. Oh, okay. Oh, we're still on the